Nobody can operate in isolation. Yeah. And the only way forward is pulling resources together and collaborating, working in partnership. So it's a sharing of experiences and knowledge as well. Hello and welcome to another episode of the HSE Talking Health and Wellbeing podcast. My name is Fergal Fox and today I'm delighted to welcome two experienced professionals to the podcast to discuss and explain the Sláinte Care Healthy Community work underway in Dublin North East Inner City and their recent evaluation report. Our guests today are Catherine Heaney from Dublin City Community Co-op and Court Donnelly from HSE Health and Wellbeing in North Dublin. Catherine is the Healthy Communities Project Coordinator and Court is a Senior Health Promotion and Improvement Officer. You're very welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much. Thanks, Virgil. It's really great to have you here because in our first ever podcast, we spoke about Sláinte Care Healthy Communities. It was a big initiative for us, addressing health inequalities. So it's great to come full circle a bit and hear how you're getting on in Dublin North and the inner city there. So you two guys have been working together on this for two years, is it? Mm, So you that, yeah. And looking at the evaluation report that kind of partnership is identified as a critical factor. How how do you work together? How does that work? Well, I suppose from a HSE point of view, we seen the Dublin City Community Co-op as very uniquely placed within the North Inner City. And being a community organisation that is based in that area and working with the people of the North East Inner City, knowing the needs of the community, it was important for us to partner with such an organisation. So partnership is, you know, that, that's a kind of a recurring theme in, in our episodes that HSC or other statutory services need to partner up with the people that have the reach or have the relationships. And Catherine, you're working there at Coalface. Can you give our listeners an idea of the communities we're talking about? You know, you know, what kind of place we're talking about in inner city Dublin? What kind of community is this? It's the northeast inner city. So it's primarily Dublin 1 and Dublin 3. And there's other small parts of Dublin 7 and Dublin 2. It's a very, very diverse community. It's an area of disadvantage. We have also pockets of affluence, which really abut areas of high deprivation. We also have new communities from other countries that are, you know, accessing services there who are living there in direct provision centres and family hubs. There's also a lot of people living in homelessness who are living in B&Bs and and they have to access services there. And then obviously people come into Dublin City to access services. So you have a transient population that comes in to access services and then comes home. So any of those on their own give you a complex set of challenges, but but like you're you're giving us multiple different kind of subpopulations there that, that require close attention. And and what kind of neighbourhoods? Can you give us an idea of, of some of the kind of community or names that we we might recognise? There's Ballybock area, there's Summer Hill, you've got Champions Avenue, uh, oh, yeah. Gardner Street, Rutland Street, Sheriff Street, East Wall. So it's it's all of those areas. Okay. So, and I mean, you'd hear them a lot, actually. People kind of like would, would have heard them on the news and, and, and media and, and that. Okay, so this report, evaluation report, this has been done by TASC, the think tank for action on social change. And what was the purpose of this evaluation report? Well, the the purpose really was to show the impact of the work that's happening. And it's the first qualitative and quantitative report. It's over a number of years as well. So it really has an awful lot of nuggets in it, I think, for other salon care areas. It tells how the programmes that are rolled out at a national level impact the day-to-day lives of people living in these communities and how they can have a massive impact and a long-term impact, I suppose, on changing the health outcomes for people in communities of disadvantage or those that are coming from vulnerable groups, you know. So to have that substantial piece of work that shows yeah. that is so important. Because this, like I suppose, measuring any health impact over time, especially with the kind of communities that you were mentioning there, Catherine, earlier, it's not an easy thing to do to measure. Mm. You can't just gather up data fairly quickly. Yeah. So we might come back into the report, but I wanted to talk about what Sláinte Healthy Communities is again, you know, just mm. make sure that listeners know what we're talking about. So I'm going to ask you to do that. And the first of yeah. all, I suppose it's not one thing, it's a suite of things. That's mm. how I kind of describe it to people. How do you describe it when you're out on the ground? Sláinte Care Health Communities was set up to address the health and well-being or improve the health and well-being of communities across the country. 
specific communities, communities of disadvantage or those that have vulnerable groups. And it's looking at it from a long term point of view. It's not just let's go in and run a program and that's it. It's how do we invest in the communities? We're looking at the bigger pieces of factors that affect health and well-being. So it's not just here's healthy eating messages. It's looking at the social determinants, those things that impact people actually taking part in a healthy eating course. So whether it's where they live, how they access the health service, the health information, education, those bigger pieces that will impact their health and well-being. So it's looking at those in relation to then delivering programmes. So what determines health is much broader than lifestyle and that social view of the world is often where that community development approach is coming from, Catherine, isn't it? And and Slauncher Health Communities is trying to take that double approach, like do lifestyle inputs and supports, but also have a vision or a way of responding to the social needs that the community is talking about, isn't that? Absolutely. And I, th- I think because it's social determinants, community development sector really have a foot in almost all of those in some way, shape or form. And I suppose community development has had a major role in health for a very long time. And I suppose that's because none of us live in a hospital, none of us live in a doctor's surgery, but every one of us live in a community. Yeah. So it makes perfect sense to bring together the clinical as such and the community and social so that there's a bridge between those because health is so much broader than having a cough or a cold. It's education, it's lifestyle choices, it's your employment, it's your access to health services and other services right the way up to political policies that trickle down to all of us living on the ground. So it wasn't brain surgery in one way to bring those two sectors together because community have been doing that for a long time. But now that we're doing that under Slanger Care, it can be that you've got huge support then from the other side. So, for example, we're getting referrals in from clinicians like GPs and primary care team. And then, you know, so you we literally are, feel like like what Coach's point earlier is the HSE isn't just commissioning no. Dublin City Co-op to do work like this is a partnership and, and our patient face and services can see the value. And, and you know, it's it's a quick no, across the board. Nobody can operate in isolation. Yeah. And the only way forward is pulling resources together and collaborating, working in partnership, a meaningful partnership where everybody is bringing something to the table that others don't have. So it's a sharing of experiences and knowledge as well. Great. So let's talk about some of the things then that that have landed there, some of the programmes and what you've heard from the community in terms of what they see as social needs, like that engagement. So first of all, the, the component parts that you have seen as, you know, successfully got lift off in your area, what have they been? Like what, what programmes have you seen that have, you know, you've seeded in there and they've kind of come to life? For the Healthy Communities Project in the northeast inner city, the programmes that the co-op deliver are social prescribing, healthy food made easy, the we can quit. Other needs that were identified would have been health literacy and the mental health and wellbeing piece. So they're probably unique factors to the northeast inner city. And can I just jump in across there, that health literacy piece, like yes. how yeah. how did you name that or, or how did that come up to you in terms of that consultation with the community? Or I suppose it would have been something that I was involved in previous role and it's something personally I feel quite passionate about. When it comes to health literacy, it's not just about reading or writing. So you could have a top oncologist in the country get bad news and their health literacy goes out the window because now they've been delivered information that they may not be receiving clearly because they're not thinking straight. So health literacy is really, it's not just about navigating things like pill bottles and prescriptions and and letters coming in. It's also about how we process the information about our health that's delivered to us. So what we done was we partnered with Nala, who are the experts in literacy, And we delivered a three hour workshop online for healthcare professionals and community development professionals on health literacy. What was it? What do we need to look out for? How do we make sure that we're making our information clear? And on the back of that, then we set up a health literacy working group. It nearly looks like 
a training video on how to do it right. So we had, obviously there was myself as the Health Communities Coordinator, it was Cautious Health Promotion. We had a public health nurse from the primary care team and then we had a literacy tutor from Dublin Adult Learning Centre. And what we done was we done a health literacy audit of the primary care centre looking at signage and wayfinding and letters and the staff were absolutely fantastic in that. And then we engaged with a literacy students group and we got them to have a look at what we thought was a great job yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, simplifying the letters and they gushed them and they were like, ah, good, good effort. But you've missed this, Mrs. I learned so much from them. And there was changes. I mean, one lady actually said, because we'd done a site visit to the primary care centre and one lady had said that we, we ran that Well Now programme, that, that health literacy programme for this literacy group as a result of that. And in that site visit, to the primary, she had said that as a result, she had stopped her GP mid-sentence and said, stop, I don't understand what you're telling me. Can you make it a bit more simple for me? Because she had never had the confidence to isn't stop. That, isn't that fantastic? Like the, the confidence or the mm. empowerment to tell, because mm. sometimes, you know, and, and this is a recurring theme, our voices to the patients, our voices to service users and in the language we use, mm. like we were, we're caught up in our own bubble a lot of the time. But she felt uh, confident enough, as you said, to pause. Exactly. Well but done, um, yeah. And I think professionals in, in whatever field they're in always have to remember that really the biggest onus is on them to make sure that the information is clear and understandable and that they're delivering in a way that the person is receiving it accurately because they are the ones with the information. The onus is on us as service users to say, you'll need to explain that to me again or can you write that down for me? It was about really top down, bottom up and to meet in the middle. And health literacy is woven into everything we do. Information, coffee mornings, the programmes that we run, like the Healthy Food and the Week and Quit and the Social Prescribing Programme, everything we do has a health literacy undercurrent yeah, to it. Yeah, or else it's not going to work. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's really, really strong. And there was another piece that you mentioned, Coach, that was... Well, just on the health literacy bit, because the North East Inner City community is so diverse and has many different cultures, English is not always people's first language. Yeah. So that's why it's so important in this particular community. It's important in general, but even more so. And I think that came to the forefront very early on for us when you're looking at how we deliver the programmes and what information is put out there for people to know about these programmes, know about the co-op, know about any kind of health information. So it becomes in a fundamental way of working. Absolutely. Right. You nearly have to start from that point of view and go, OK, if English is not my first language or I have any kind of learning disability or visual impairment or hearing, how am I going to navigate this? How am I going to actually and how are we actually going to engage with those people that live in that community? Because they are the ones that are probably vulnerable and in amongst those environments that don't always are accessible or inclusive, do you know? Yeah, yeah. So we've talked about some of the program components before. We've had a podcast episode on social prescribing. We've spoken to Sarah Halpin before one of the, you know, she's delivering the We Can Quit program, we learned a bit about that. The Healthy Food Made Easy mm. has been referenced by a couple of our guests. Mm. So they're all delivering to your communities. And, and what has that response been to those programmes? It's been positive across the board. Yeah. Especially now when I'm thinking about a Healthy Food Made Easy, there's been, the report actually shows that there's been a reduction in things like takeouts. People are really conscious of their salt and their sugar intake now. They're eating more meals that they've cooked. But I suppose behind all those things are the stories. So we've had people that are saying they're cooking with the kids now. As we do the children's version as well, the cool dudes. We've had people, one particular gentleman who's living in a homeless accommodation said that he hadn't cooked in five for himself in five years. Oh my God. That, that he hadn't done that. Yeah. So he was now kind of like re-energised yeah. to do that. And actually, I think he had wanted, from my recollection, wanted to train in catering or chef. And he was thinking about maybe that that could be something he could look yeah. at again. When you think of the environment that we have, though, in terms of mm. like every shop has a massive deli of processed foods and, mm -hmm. and, you know, that kind of high sugar, high salt and, you know, that that's yeah. so it's very easy. It's too easy, I guess. You know, we're making the unhealthy choice very much the easier choice. But anyway, sorry, I cut across you there. No, that's OK. No. And yeah. And I mean, 
if it's cheap and it's cheaper yeah. to do it yourself. Ultimately, it is because the program teaches people to shop on a budget. I suppose with the, the We Can Quit, I always think of the very first group that we had, which had to be done online because we were in lockdown because of the pandemic and kind of like all of the girls that had quit. But I also think of one particular gentleman who had smoked for I think it was 50 years or 60 years. Like, can I, I think he was eight or something when he had his first oh cigarette and really didn't think he could yeah. quit. Yeah. And it still quit. And it's those things. I mean, I'm an ex-smoker myself and, and I know just how hard it is, you know, and to see people so proud of themselves that they didn't think they could do it. And the support that the facilitator, Sarah being one of them, give to people is phenomenal. And also, it's the support from each other. In that weekly meeting, especially if somebody maybe has slipped that week, that's the week they really need to come. And the support they get from each other going, but don't be even worried about it. Just let's go. Like, let's get on with it. I think that's one of the, the things from those groups, like the Healthy Food Made Easy group. You have people talking about the challenges, the people talking about like cooking for their kids or that, you know, yeah. or being too busy or getting caught up or getting into bad habits in terms of, of, of some of what the, you might be buying, the takeaways that you mentioned. And the same thing with that peer support you're talking about, I think, from the We Can Quit. Like, it's like, it's free support from mm. your own peers and that you value that more, don't you? Or you can value it more, you know, because it's grounded in reality. Absolutely. And because, and look, listen, you need to know that you're not on your own yeah. and other people are experiencing that. Certainly with the healthy food, I, I'm, I'm thinking of a group that was run again online in the earlier kind of years of the project. And it was, I think there was multiple nationalities on that group yeah. and everybody started sharing their recipes and the facilitator was able to adapt and encourage people. And there was conversations going on on this Zoom meeting with people in their own kitchens going, oh, now, well, in, in Africa, we do this and in Brazil, we do that. And it was just to hear that story of the sharing of different cultural because food means a lot of things to a lot of different people. And one of the things is that kind of like the social context. Yeah. So to actually see the sharing of that and hear the sharing of that was really quite uplifting, you know, yeah. to the acceptance of everyone and wanting to know more about each Across other. Cross-cultural healthy food it made was easy. fantastic. Yeah. And the source prescribing is another piece that you've been really focused on in, in recent years. How has that gone for you? Well, it's gone from strength to strength, really. Like Katra mentioned, the Health Communities Project in the Northeast Inner City started in the middle of public health restrictions because of COVID. So starting social prescribing off in that environment was definitely difficult and challenging. But I suppose what the report is is showing us is the impact of having something like social prescribing is more valuable now because I think we're still dealing with some kind of a, a hangover from COVID in terms of loneliness and so social isolation. And social prescribing for a lot of people has been a way back into their communities, into the different programmes like Healthy Food Made Easy or into health services or, or education or, or different things like that. So it has been a really important part of the Health Communities Project in the Northeast Inner City to join the dots up an awful a lot to all the different organisations that are in that area doing great work yeah. that might not always be as connected, but it also is a pathway into some of the health services that maybe people found that they didn't know how to access. And it's been a great way to connect the healthcare professionals in the HSC together as well. You know, it has been that connector or that bridge, as Catherine mentioned before. Yeah, so, so maybe explain a, a tiny bit. Some of our listeners may may not have heard our previous pieces on social prescribing, but it is about linking people into social supports. Can you describe a bit more about that, Catherine? Yeah. And I mean, again, it's going back to what I said earlier about we don't live in our doctor surgery, but we do live in a community. For example, if you went to your doctor saying, you know, you're fe you know, feeling quite isolated, you're feeling a bit down and rather than give a medical prescription, they give a social prescription. So that person then is referred to us. We spend a significant amount of time building a relationship with that person, uh, meeting certainly the first time we meet with them, really getting to know them and for them to get to know us because you're building a trust there. And what we do then is we aim to, it's a person centred service. It's built around 
the individual and what they want, not what we think they want or the doctor thinks they want. It's what they want, what supports them, because they're the expert in their lives and they're the expert in their bodies. So we link them in to local services, projects, groups and organisations that are on their doorstep that will help support their physical and mental health and well-being. And some, sometimes is it the fact that some people are reluctant to make that jump? They're ignorant. Maybe they don't even know that those supports are out there that, and, you know, would only love to have them engage or they, they need that kind of bridge. You know, they need to kind of build trust with somebody before they're able to engage in that sort of support. They're all those different types of... It's very complex. Okay. It's never an easy journey. Some people maybe don't know the services are there. And I mean, none of us know what service is there until we need it. Yeah, All yeah, of a yeah. sudden, we can't believe something's been there for 30 years and we didn't know about it. But I think really what we're saying is people's confidence is maybe quite low. Or, you know, they may be suffering from a bit of depression and anxiety. Certainly that hangover, as Koch said, from COVID, that isolation and trying to get back on the horse, so to speak, out there. And I think as well, sometimes people are afraid to engage that maybe they have, you know, maybe they have never engaged in their community before. So there's maybe like that English isn't their first language. Maybe they're in recovery or they they yeah. might have addiction issues. I sometimes think that when I see like even sports clubs doing a open day and everybody welcome and I think that should be the sign all the time, but it's not all the sign all the time. Yeah. You know, like we're doing the open day, we're taking registrations and then it shutters down. You know, we're mm. not we're not kind of inviting people like and perhaps more services or groups and should have that everybody welcome sign. I know it's difficult to have that every day of the week, but to be outreaching, you know, but I suppose that link worker makes the connection. Absolutely. And then I suppose sometimes people can find it hard to engage for various reasons. Yeah. So what we did was we ran it six weeks of coffee mornings specifically for social prescribing clients, maybe people that didn't quite find something that they connected with. Maybe they were waiting for an appointment with a service or maybe were just really struggling to get out into the community. So what we done was we put together six weeks and Lorraine Tui, our link worker, worked to get speakers in every week because herself and Lewis would have a lot of their clients where it were accessing this. So they would be there every week. They got speakers in from local organisations, from health promotion and all those. So people so had you, something. You created the warm space. Yes. Oh, very good. very good. And as a result of that, what people said in that group was, we wish we had somewhere that we could go, that we didn't have to sign up to something yeah. for six weeks or eight weeks, that we come in or drop out as we see fit when we felt we were able to engage and that we felt that we were kind of accepted and it was non-judgmental and it was kind of an easy kind of environment. So I kind of went ahead of it. So what we done was now we have an open community coffee morning every Monday morning in Killarney Court Community Hall from 10 to 12. And you can come in if you've had a good weekend. You can come in if you've had a bad weekend. You can, we always have something going on. Either we're making something from the healthy food book. Banana bread is a real favourite. We're going to have to have an intervention with people. Oh, that's soon enough. <laughs> we might do adult colouring. We might have a speaker in. We might just sit and chat. We might do a little bit of Tai Chi or, you know. But some, you're getting consistent engagement yes. with that. Oh, so every because it's week. warm, non-committal. You're not yeah. adding stress to a stressed person. No, yeah. but yeah. It's, it's a point of contact yeah. as well. So if people want information, if we have somebody on social prescribing waiting for an appointment, we can send them to the coffee morning. We can have somebody that might pop in and say, I've never been here before, but I'm after getting this letter and I don't know what it means. Or can you help me fit out a form? All done over a cup of tea because yeah. the Irish are great at this. It's their part of our culture. Our best work is done on tea breaks. You know, once you put a cup of tea in someone's hand, I always said from my community development practice, it was the most devastating tool I had in my toolbox because it changes the dynamic of something when you're sitting with a cup of tea in your hand. People physically relax. They feel more comfortable and they open up a little bit more. I don't know what it is, but it works like a charm. Great. So we yeah. created that environment. Yeah, that's that's really special. And the other piece that's kind of unique to your initiative is mm. the community health workers. Yes. Now, like how many community health workers have you worked in the community? I, I guess you better describe the role, first of all, Court. Can you do, 
Tell us a bit about. So the community health workers is was a piece that was in from the start with the Healthy Communities Project. So from the very beginning, it's not in every other healthy communities area or program across the country. It's very unique to the northeast inner city. And I suppose the whole point of that really was to get people from the area supporting the people in the area. So there is three community health workers at the moment in the northeast inner city and they support the overall health they're program. They're from the community. They're from the community. They're born and bred there. They know the community. They're even, as Catherine would say, even outside their hours of work, they're still working because when they go to the shop or maybe on their way home, they might meet somebody and they might just casual conversation. Listen, as Catherine said, pop down to the coffee morning or, you know, this is where we are. They're trusted. They're known. That's huge in communities like the Northeast Inner City is that trusted person, that source of information is going to be taken on board. It's like peer education as well. Yeah. You know, it's not the HSE coming in to tell the community this is what you should do or this is how you should do it. We are supporting the community to support their own community yeah. and build that capacity in the community for so I suppose the whole point of healthy communities is that it, it is sustainable. It's long term change for health and well-being. So if you invest in the communities like that, they take ownership over that change and they are the change then. It's long term. We won't see it overnight, but it also adds a sense of value yeah, to, I, I, to I, the people in, in that community, that they are valued and seen and important and worth investing in. Yeah. And are essentially the change makers of those behavior changes. So it's it's really valuable piece. It is very unique to the northeast inner city, but it's a role that I suppose because the project started in COVID, it was an opportunity for Catherine and the health team to do an awful lot of training, whether that was in making every contact count around social prescribing, really getting building the capacity. So, so that, when you recruited the yeah. community health workers, you were stuck in terms of that face to face contact and you, mm. you mentioned some of the programs going online but you did the capacity building for these new staff during the yeah. restrictive measures the lockdown and I suppose we could have viewed it as being very difficult and it was a very difficult situation a brand new project brand new staff a serious amount of training needed to be done and induction and none of us could meet in the same place so uh, you can only imagine like you're kind of sitting there well I certainly sat there and went what am I going to do but I think you can see something as a challenge rather than a problem. So what we done was we used it as quiet time to really take a breath in and get ready to exhale into the community. So we, we took the first three, four months, even though we were promoting the programme in the ways that we could in the environment we had, we were also using things like Teams and Zoom to do all of that training in-house training, plus linking into external training, like motivational interviewing and the, and the MEC, and to really build a relationship and build the team, yeah. to build the health team and build the relationships with each other. Certainly we, the community health workers, at that time we didn't have a full-time social prescribing link worker. So I trained the community health workers to operate as, as social prescribing link workers. And then there was a, men when we could actually had limited contact with people, that we were able to do a shadowing and mentoring piece there. So we were, it, I suppose, in one sense, the pressure was off just a little bit to be able to do that the right way without trying to fast track it, that it was done the right way to build that very slowly. So I suppose going back to what Kat was saying about the community, the people who work and live in the community. So community development is only relative to the community you're developing. So who better to do that than the people living in the community? Yeah, I think it changes the... You know, sometimes disadvantaged areas and in, in terms of my experience, you, you come across this kind of poverty of ambition. But when you're able to give an opportunity to somebody in the community, mm -hmm. you know, everybody's looking around going, how, how did they get there? Like, you know, there's opportunities all of a sudden that you're kind of seeding ambition and you're, you're you know, isn't that you're, you're literally trying to change the game. So it's all about capacity building, confidence yeah. building. And the biggest thing is acknowledging people's in innate knowledge in themselves and in their community and in the challenges and issues on a daily basis. They're the experts and then using that and building it. Yeah. I mean, there was other pieces of work. So when we were running the healthy food made easy, obviously we weren't doing a face to face, had to go on Zoom. So I kind of sit now, well, it's going to make us different than if somebody just logged on to an online video to watch, you know, a famous chef. Yeah. 
cook something. And this is where the community health workers are worth their weight in gold. I mean, absolutely. We put the facilitators for the healthy food put together ingredient packs, individual ingredient packs for each of the people that had enrolled on it. And the community health workers every week would come in, divvy up the packs and deliver them to people's doorsteps. And they were able to have those conversations. How are you doing? How are you hanging in there? You know, do you need anything in the shops? Are you OK? That gave an unbelievable opportunity. And then that person just had to take the pack, log on, tip all the stuff, the ingredients out and you were ready to go. And then you were Literally invited. Make, making it easy. Exactly. <laughs> definitely making it easy. And yep. you were invited into each other's kitchens then. But it was the community health workers that enabled us to do that. Okay, they great. were the critical linchpin in linking with people and checking in on people and spreading the word on the ground about the Healthy Communities Project. What kind of impact has this had on people on the ground? You know, you mentioned that example there. That sounds really good in terms of COVID. But in, in terms of this report, what is it saying or does it have, you know, some examples of the impact on, on the local people here? When I think about impact Certainly around the social prescribing, I think one particular gentleman who is happy to share his story, he was referred in by a link worker to social prescribing and he was living in a shielding unit. He was homeless and living in a shielding unit because he had a number of long term chronic conditions. He was very isolated because he had serious mobility issues and no way to really get around and the lift in the place where he was staying, it was always broken. So he was, he could be confined to one small room for days at a time because he couldn't get out. So I suppose in the jigs and the reels of it, we were able to hook him up with Zoom. He done the Living Well with Chronic Conditions programme online, which had a, a massive impact on him. That's, the, another, the, that's another programme that kind of sucks some of the peers as well. Oh, you know, absolutely. That could, anyway, go on. Sorry. I, but it's no, no, and I mean, it's a fantastic programme. I would have been involved in it for years myself. It's incredible. But then his mobility, it was getting out. Yeah. So what our link worker done was referred him to OT. This is where this partnership is just, it's beautiful. Because we were able to refer into the primary care team. OT took the case and eventually he got a mobility scooter transformed his ability to access services. And he went on to do the Healthy Food Made Easy, the Wellbeing and Stress Management. He went on to do the chair yoga. All he could do because it was all adaptable uh, for people with mobility. He went ahead and done the XL program and then became involved with an external group and was engaged with their services. Ultimately, they actually asked him, would he sit as a representative, a voice of the service user on their committee? And he's waiting to get the keys to his, his new home. And it was because of the intense work that the link worker done with them about ringing them. Are you OK? Would you like me to meet you and go down to the XWell with you? Do you need me to ring anyone for you? You want me to help you fill in this form? And ringing about the housing list and all of that. The link workers support people to do that. And sometimes they may have to make a call for somebody um, or help somebody fill in, fill in the form. And this man has had huge leaps and bounds in he's always going to be living with it sounds like a transformation from that kind of caged piece that you you know that you didn't have any access before at the, at the and it's not like his all his chronic conditions have gone away yeah. but it's about how you deal with them then and how you put them in into context in your life so you can cope better with long term chronic conditions when you have distraction like community groups programs. You feel more confident to ask a question of your GP or to ask a pharmacist to explain that medication to you than if you had no confidence and you were you were completely isolated and you had no contact with other human beings. And there's the difference. It's not that there's a magical cure. It's just connectivity yeah. to other humans. Isn't that the basic point that we all want? Social connection. How do you see us impact on the community here? You won't have an example as strong as, as that one now, no. but have you, uh, um, in terms of what you've seen. I suppose working with Catherine and the health team in the co-op over the last number of years, it has been amazing to see the journey and how the project has evolved, how it started and where it is now in terms of the reach, the confidence within the, the team, but also how the programmes although they might just be about healthy food, they're actually having massive impacts on 
overall health and well-being and a lot more of the community is getting to engage with the co-op so the co-op are reaching out as much as the community is is engaging with them so i i suppose in terms of impact it it just shows the value of investing in a, a project or like health communities that it can have you know and in terms of reorienting mm-hmm. the health services you know getting the getting yeah. your internal colleagues to see yeah. that these supports are not just valid but they're really really valued yeah and that they work yeah you know and that has been a huge part of it if we were to go back to basic health promotion principles about the participation the empowerment the sustainability piece you know and the equity like people from these communities don't always get the same chance to get into healthcare and and get the health information that they need to make those healthy choices so it's addressing an awful lot of things, whether it's social determinants, whether it's health inequalities from both sides. So from the community side, as much as the HSC side. So although we are working with the co-op and supporting Catherine and the team to do and deliver, we're also working with our HSC colleagues to, I suppose, link them in to what yeah. Catherine's doing and, and be that link. And you know, it's it's nearly like taking that holistic approach to health and well-being. It's not just the medical side. It's all the other elements that we've spoken about here, whether it's healthy food, whether it's social prescribing, taking all of that into consideration. You know, that's how you're going to actually improve the overall health and well-being of a population of a community is by looking at it as a whole yeah. and taking all of those elements and all those stakeholders into account and, and bringing them along with you on a journey. Have I heard that the parenting is going to be added to your, your suite of delivery in 2024? So it, it's there. The National College of Ireland have the, the tender for delivering the parenting programs in the northeast inner city. So they're well established in, in the parenting world, I suppose, and deliver those programs. There's a parent strategy group that sit within the northeast inner city that involve all the different stakeholder groups they're looking at delivery of that. I suppose for that area, it would be one of the higher areas that there would be an awful lot more children with disabilities or additional needs. And so parenting programs, I suppose, are of a, a higher need for yeah, yeah. parents there to help them. A lot of what we're finding is with parenting programs is reducing the stigma of going to a parenting program for all parents. You know, like people kind of think, sure, I know how to how to do this or I'm not a bad parent. It's not about that. It's about, again, going back to some of that peer support from that, that's Absolutely. there in the other groups. Absolutely. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And particularly for parents that may have children with additional needs and they're on waiting lists or they're maybe feeling a little bit isolated because they're not connected. Maybe they're new into a community. It's providing that yeah, link and, and that support. You can't, you can't buy that. You know, you were talking earlier yeah. catching about that cup of tea conversation. But imagine that a parent with a child with some special need that they're trying to figure out yeah. meeting another parent. That's yeah. in the same boat. There's nothing as strong or supportive yeah. of meeting a parent in the same boat. Yeah, because you feel like I'm not on my own in this world. <laughs> you know, exactly. And it's with. that kind of just they get it. Yeah, yeah, they know where I'm at. And, you know, so there's work happening with the National College of Ireland to, to roll that out. And there's a parenting coordinator specifically for the Northeast Inner City as well, who would be supporting that rollout. So it is, it's exciting. The training is happening, but it is exciting because of the needs of that area as well. Great, great. So before we finish, I guess I want to, you know, you've got your evaluation report. You're going to be working now for the rest of 2024. Where do you see this going, 24, 25? What's your kind of thoughts and dreams as a kind of a wrap up piece for today's podcast? Catherine, I come to you first. To see the project grow. Yeah. And to see the delivery grow, to continue with that real strength. That's the health team. And also, I suppose, just to mention that that health team is based. We're a small part of a bigger team. And that bigger team in the co-op, all that staff, they have incredible knowledge in the most unbelievable amount of subjects. And if we don't know the answer, we know somebody who might know somebody who knows somebody like it's like a phone tree. So I suppose building on that, also like building things like our coffee mornings and meeting the needs of the community. Um, That's the most satisfying thing for you. Oh, absolutely. Like it's meeting people where they're at. Yeah. Without any judgment. And what they need. 
because everybody needs different supports and all of us need different supports at different times in our lives as well. It's not a one size fits all. So what's really good about this type of work is you never know what's going to happen every day. And it's just who you're going to meet, the stories you're going to hear and to build on that. So I really see that the project itself will grow and, and certainly that our community health workers and, and our health team will become stronger and stronger and will have a further reach. And you, you can only do that with time. It's the long game. Yeah. These things are only sustainable when they're built very slowly and it's slow and steady, really wins the race when it's come to this. And and certainly I, certain around social prescribing, I mean, social prescribing really should be the first port of call, not the last resort. So to to see more and more referrals uh, coming in. I mean, we get incredible for referrals now, but <laughs> it's never enough. We always want more, 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 more. So I think, yeah, it's just growing the project. OK, and you mentioned some of that earlier on, Coach, about the long term. So wh- wh- where's your head at now? I just think it's been a really great example of a really positive partnership. I know with every partnership, there is there's give and take and there is getting to know each other, I suppose, and working to each other's strengths and really, you know, supporting the HSE and, and the co-op working together with working with the community in the northeast inner city. But it's just been a really good example of. Yeah. I love the phrase you said there, the plan to our strengths. Yeah. That, you know, you're not doing the same thing. No, and, and we don't and, need to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We work together, we complement each other. And I think that's the whole point of it yeah. is to complement each other and, and amplify out what we do for an overall aim of improving the lives of people that live in the northeast inner city. As Catherine said, it's come over time. You know, it doesn't, these things aren't built quickly. It's built slowly. It's getting to know each other. It's building that respect, that trust among two different organisations, but with that shared vision. Yeah. 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 Well, I'd like to compliment you on your work and appreciate the evaluation, the work that went into that by task and other stakeholders. Mm. And I'd like to wish you the best of luck in the ongoing rollout of Slaunch Care Health Community in the East Inner City, Dublin. And thank you for coming in today. Thanks Thanks very very much. much. And thank you to the listeners for tuning in to another episode of the HSE Talking Health and Wellbeing podcast.